All right. Um, we've been talking for a, a number of days about the different kinds of evidence for the text of the Greek New Testament. You can see on the screen uh, the Greek unseal script. Unseal means capital of Sinaiticus. It's a blow up of one of the columns of Sinaiticus. And it's, in fact, uh, part of Acts chapter 8. And uh, in the ninth century, there was a great textual revision of some kind. And the way that Greek letters were written changed from being unsealed script, like you see up on the screen, to being cursive or minuscule script, like you see up on the screen here. Uh, this is cursive or minuscule script, which is very hard to read because it all runs together. Uh, manuscript 321, which we have a copy of here, the beginning of the Gospel of, of uh, or not the Gospel of Mark, it's the beginning of the book of Colossians. And you'll see right after the big uh, red and blue doohinky there in the middle, you have in you have in <coughs> excuse me, you have the title in unsealed script, Pros Colossaius, to the Colossians. Then you go down there to where the minuscule script begins, and that fancy letter there is a P or a Pi, however you say it, Paulos, first word. And you, you, you learned in your Greek that if you write a sigma in its final form, you write it like an S instead of like the regular sigma. Wow. But uh-uh, uh not here. You see Paulos, the first word ends in an S, and it's the sigma that you said you learned was in the middle and not at the end. <laughs> so why did they teach us that way in, in Greek in the rules? Well, you know. That stuff only goes so far. The next word is apostolos, and it also ends in that same kind of a sigma. And then you have the abbreviated Jesus and Christ with a line over it there. See the two little words, Jesus Christ? Can you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right. And uh, then uh, it says, uh, by the will of God... And in the second line, you've got God again there right next to the P with a line over it. And then it says Chi and Timotheos, Timothy, Ho Adelphos. You'll notice that uh, after the word Timotheos, which also ends with your sigma, you have Ho Adelphos. Can you see that? Yeah. All right. And you see the delta, how the delta is written? It's more like the delta you learned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. So really, the cursive script, if you really pull it apart, is more like the Greek that you learned. But it's, it's very difficult to read unless you're, you're used to it. And uh, this is the type of script that began to be standard in the ninth century and is standard in all the centuries after that, now, manuscript 321, if I can look it up here in the front of this Greek Testament, if they have it listed. Let's, what's that? What is that written in the margin of manuscript 321? Um, I, I might, let's see here. I don't know what that's all about. There's some notations from an editor out there. <clears throat> but I don't really know what that is. Let me see if I can find this one real quickly. Or not. These are lectionaries. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Three twenty one is a manuscript of Acts and the Pauline Epistles. This is the front piece of Colossians. 
And it dates from the 12th century. 12th century. See, this is the kind of manuscript that was available for the production of what we call the Textus Receptus, or the majority text, which uh, Erasmus created, which the King James and New King James and things like that are based on. Okay? So this is from the 12th century. Now, if we back up a couple of slides, that one is from about the year 200. That's one of the papyrus unseals. And uh, let me back up again. This one, Sinaiticus, is from the 300s. It's a parchment unseal. Very old. But this one is from 1200 and it is part of what would be called the majority text. The majority text. Now those that uh, that today um, try to support the majority text, they'll often call it the majority text, they are supporters of the text that lies underneath the King James Version. And the reason that it's the majority text is because the majority of manuscripts that survive are dated after the ninth century and are this minuscule or cursive type of writing. And they are the ones on which the KJV was based, at least a few of them. This is um, another um, typical minuscule manuscript. This is the first part of the Gospel of Luke. And... Uh, Again, it's in this same kind of uh, script that you have in the other post ninth century uh, manuscripts. You notice the E there that begins, the epsilon is pretty cool. It's sort of a little gargoyle, little dragon-y kind of a figure that's made into the, the E. Um, in the first um, part of the Gospel of Luke, See if I can find it here on this other. See, the first word is hepe de pair, inasmuch as, and the E there, the epsilon there that you see at first, is the epsilon that you see here on this manuscript. See? Inasmuch as, that's the word on the first line, the second line, poloi, many have taken in hand to develop an account of the things that have transpired among us. So this is another of those manuscripts, like manuscript 321, that we have bukus of. These are Greek cursive or minuscule manuscripts. Minuscule just means small or cursive. So you have unseal, which means capital, as you already know. And then you have minuscule, which means cursive or small. And um, the minuscule manuscripts are dated from the ninth century and onward. Okay, now, the minuscule manuscripts are represented by numbers, uh, regular numbers that do not have a um, zero in front of them. If a number has a zero in front of it, that's another unsealed manuscript, but without the zero, it's a... Minuscule manuscript. Let me show you here in just a few minutes. 
for example, um, all right, minuscule number one. If you're looking in the footnote of your Greek New Testament that lists this manuscript, that manuscript has the Gospels, Acts, and the Pauline Epistles, and it's from the 12th century. Uh, there's also part of this manuscript that has the book of Revelation, 12th century. Then manuscript 13 is a gospel manuscript. E is for Evangelion, gospels. It's from the 13th century. Manuscript 28 is a gospel manuscript, and it's from the 11th century. Manuscript 33 is Gospels, Acts, and Pauline Epistles, like this one up here. And it's from the 9th century. For a minuscule, it's pretty old. Manuscript 81, Acts and the Pauline Epistles, from the year 1044. There was something on that manuscript that dated it in an exact year. <clears throat> manuscript 88, 12th century. Look at this one, from the year 1087. Acts, Paul, and Revelation. So you can see the column over here, these dates, and you can see these numbers. So if you, if you see in the footnote of your Greek New Testament, like down here, you're looking at a, at a, at a reading here that's supported by certain manuscripts. See these numbers, 1009, 1010, 1071, 1079. You know by looking at those numbers that those are all late cursive minuscule manuscripts. Do you follow me or not? Yep. Yes. All right. And they are all very late in date. Now these up here that are represented by these capital letters, these are parchment unseal manuscripts. Parchment unseals. See, these here is 28, 565, blah, blah, blah. These are later cursive manuscripts. Now, sometimes after it gives you several of these numbers, it will give you a BYZ. Write that down, BYZ, capital and then small like this. What that means is, in addition to these, the majority of Byzantine manuscripts means, it basically means all the rest of these cursive, late cursive manuscripts, basically. That's what BYZ means, but it means Byzantine. The majority of these late Byzantine manuscripts. Okay. And we'll talk about some more of those things. So, for example, in this reading right here, uh, I just picked one at random. Uh, you've got manuscript 28 right there. See where it lists number 28? So I go back to the, to the front of the Greek New Testament here, and I find manuscript 28, gospel manuscript, 11th century. Shows you what I'm dealing with. Also in that reading, I noticed that it had manuscript 565 right there. Gospel manuscript, 9th century. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Go ahead. So what, so, okay. So did I hear you say that one of the um, of the unseals are represented by a zero in front of a number? Well, and if the, it's just the, the plain number, it's the other one, the minuscule. That is correct. It's not just one of the unseals. <clears throat> All unseals have a number, but it's with a zero in front of it. <clears throat> but they also, a lot of them, have a capital letter. <laughs> and usually in a, in, a, in a reading, at the footnote of your Greek New Testament, your main unseals will be like 
Sinaiticus, which is the Hebrew Aleph, and then capital B, which is Vaticanus, and then capital C, which is Ephraimi Rescriptus. You don't have to write all this down. These are just different, different, famous unseal capital letter manuscripts. They'll have letter representations. Now, sometimes after all the letters, you'll have a number or two that has a zero in front of it. Those are also unseal manuscripts, probably later ones from like 6th, 7th, 8th century, but they're unseal, meaning what? Capital letters. Capital, Capital letters, okay. But then you'll have numbers that don't have a zero in front of them, and those are what kind of manuscripts? Minuscule or cursive manuscripts like the one that we have on the screen here or like this one here. See? Now, are the cursive manuscripts, the minuscule manuscripts, earlier in date or later in date? Later. They are later in date. Do we have more of these or less of these than the ancient papyrus manuscripts? Everybody? They're later in time, so they probably preserve more of them. Yeah, we have many more of these. That's why the supporters of the King James call it the majority text. Uh, See? Because there are more of these later manuscripts that survive and less of those really old, earlier manuscripts that survive. So to the uneducated person, they'll say far more manuscripts support these readings than support those readings. And that sounds like, well, everybody ought to, ought to go with the majority vote, right? Like democracy. But they don't understand what we're talking about. Okay. So we have many of these, and they're listed by number. All right, so... We talked about those readings. The character of these majority manuscripts, these late minuscule manuscripts, which are called in some texts, like when you're reading Bruce Metzger here, the text of the New Testament, which you all should own this. Every one of you should have this book and read it. Uh, it it's called The Text of the New Testament by Bruce Manning Metzger. I've got it recommended on your syllabus. But this book, when he talks about the Byzantine text type, he's talking about the revised, after the ninth century, most of the minuscule manuscript te text type. Okay? And uh, it is characterized by these types of things. It has conflated readings. That's when there were two or three variants, and instead of picking one that was original, they'd put them all in there. It has growing texts, like the doxologies getting longer and longer, you know. Thine is the kingdom, amen. Thine is the kingdom and the power, amen. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, amen. Thou is, thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever, world without end, amen. They've got these kinds of things in them, because they've grown over time. They have harmonizations. What scribes tended to do was erase ambiguity. If there was ambiguity in the original text, they didn't like anything being ambiguous or unclear, and so they would make it clearer, they thought. So if there was something that was ambiguous because one gospel said this and another gospel put it a little bit differently, they would tend to harmonize them and make them word the, the same so there wouldn't be any ambiguity, see? And uh, so same thing as I talked to you before about in the accounts of Paul's conversion in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, where it was worded slightly differently, they would tend to harmonize it, make it word exactly the same. So there wouldn't be a seeming contradiction that we didn't understand. See? Um, <clears throat> so they tried to erase ambiguity through harmonizations. Then, one of the other characteristics was they tried to make things explicit, which were implicit 
in the older text. The, the older text would say he, and they would replace that he with God or Christ or the Spirit or something like that to make it specific and explicit so that you wouldn't have to wonder who he was. Uh, the older text might say it, and they would try to determine who it was, and they would make it explicit who it was. Uh, one of the good examples of that is, and let's look at Romans 8.28. <clears throat> I'm more familiar with this because in, in graduate school in text criticism class, my paper was on Romans 8.28. <clears throat> so I looked up a lot of manuscripts that had Romans 8.28. Of course, they didn't have chapters and verses. And the original text says uh, panta sunerge, which is he works all things. But some of them in the later manuscripts were not satisfied to leave it, he works all things. They put the word God in there, God works all things, see? And that's, that's a fair guess. It's either God or the Holy Spirit, same difference, six of one, half of the, half of the dozen of the other. But the original text says, Sunerge, he works, panta, all, all things. And some, some of them have translated it, all things work. That's wrong. All things don't do anything. Things just lay there. Things are inanimate. Things don't do anything. But somebody, namely God in this text, takes all the things, that is the good things and the bad things, the suffering and the joy in your life, and he works it together for good according to his purpose. That's what the text really says, see. But it does not, the original text does not say who he is. It just says he. But some of your translations, how do your translations read in Romans 8, 28? Who's, who's got that new American? And we know that God causes all things to work together. All right, does it have God in italics or anything like that? Um, Footnote uh, says. One early manuscript reads, all things work together for good. Okay, and that's all it says? Uh-huh. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Let's look at a textual variant here. It says what? One early manuscript? Yes. Yep. Didn't Read, tell us this all way. things work together. That's funny. Yeah. It's really it's really laughably funny. Okay. So here's here's the Sunerge, which is the reading here. That's third person singular. So you have ergo, but it's third person singular. Soon means together with. So literally here, he works together. Are you with me or not? Yes. That's manuscript Sinaiticus, manuscript... Ephraimi Rescriptus, that these are all unsealed manuscripts from early. Manuscript Biza or Claromontanus here in the, in the Epistles of Paul. Uh, manuscript uh, Georgia, manuscript um, Athos Lori. And then he's got a bunch of uh, weird minuscules that support this early reading. A lot of the Byzantine manuscripts do. And it's a What's the C in brackets in front of Sunerge? The C in brackets is the, the, the security they have about this being the reading. They're, it's kind of a toss-up. There's, there's mixed evidence here, and so they give it a C. If they gave it an A, they'd be really certain about it. If they gave it a B, they would be somewhat certain about it. If they give it a C, it could go either way. See? 
So, Sunerge. And uh, that's their preferred reading, though they're not positive about it. Then they come down here, and they have the first double slash, and they have another one. They have God works, and that has a very old reading, P46. That's the manuscript yours is talking about. And then it has Alexandrinus and Vaticanus and some of the Coptic Sahidic. Uh, and this, see? Now say you have this small handful of manuscripts here. And then you have all of these unsealed, and you have this. So this really is the majority text, but it's supported by some of the best old unsealed. This one is old. And usually the writers, the, the editors would go with this one. But um, it... it it follows a characteristic that many of the later manuscripts followed, which is when something was implicit to make it explicit. The, the, the scribes didn't tend to take away something that was explicit and make it implicit. They didn't do that. They did it the other way around. And that's why the readers, I mean the editors, believe that this is probably the original reading in this case. But instead of just studying it on this, like this, I actually looked up manuscripts and read manuscripts and looked at these things and, and said, okay, uh, let me see what we have here. There was even one, and I don't even think it mentions it here, Let's see if it mentions it here. No, it doesn't. It doesn't tell you here. But in my paper, there was a manuscript or two that actually put the Holy Spirit in there. P and A. So, um, is there one listed in yours that says that? I just have it in from my notes from Denny's class. The, the first one um, that he, because of the text, he believes the Holy Spirit is what this is talking about. I agree. I it's think he's correct. 26, 27. Yep, I think he's right. I taught him well. So <laughs> any, anyway, uh, he. I think that's correct. So back to the other screen. Making things implicit or making things explicit that were implicit in the, in the older readings. That's one of the characteristics of these later ones. And most all of the later ones have Panta Sunerge. He works all things. All right, so another thing, inclusion of marginal notes would be things like, you've got the story of the woman taken in adultery that I gave you a paper on there. Uh, by the way, that, that paper, let's, let's go to that real quickly. The paper that's uh, the woman taken in adultery. You got it? Yes. In the printed Greek New Testament of the mid-16th century, the Gospel of John contains the story of the woman taken in adultery in John 7, 53 to 8, 11. Everybody with me now? Yes. Yep. All right. Erasmus's third edition of the printed Greek text was the basis for the translation of the King James Version and thus popularized the story of the woman taken in adultery in preaching and teaching for generations. As time passed and scholars discovered many more ancient manuscripts than those which were available to Des Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam when he prepared the text to be printed in the 1500s, they began to see that uh, some marginal scribal notes, I got a misprint there, had been added to the original text of the New Testament by scribes in a few places along after the time of the apostles. The story of the woman taken in adultery is likely one of those additions. Jesus had been speaking in the temple in John 7. In fact, Jesus continues teaching at the temple until John 8:59. John tells us briefly in John 7, 45 to 52, what was going on in the Jewish high court 
while Jesus was teaching in the temple. Then he returns to Jesus and his interactions with people in the temple courts. The people who had gathered for the feast were giving all kinds of conflicting opinions about Jesus' identity. These conflicting opinions caused a division among the people gathered in the temple courts. Officers of the Jewish high court were sent to arrest Jesus, but returned empty-handed, saying of Jesus, no one ever spoke this way, John 7, 46. The rulers of the Jews argued over Jesus and chided Nicodemus for giving Jesus a chance. They said, search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. That's John 7, 52. And by the way, since we're... Since we're um, talking about this text, see, this is one of the oldest manuscripts we have. Uh, no prophet arises from Galilee is where you have the uh, green arrow there. And then after, on that same line at the end, you have something that looks kind of like a period, and then you have the word pollen, which means again. You see it? Second line. Yes, yeah. no, maybe. Yes, yes, yes. All right. That's John 8, 12, where it says begin. So John 7, 52 is right where you have the period, and then you've got John 8, 12. All right, which they didn't have chapters and verses. So that's where I am in the paper here. Now, in the next sentence on the paper, in the oldest manuscripts of the Greek text, the scene then returns to what Jesus was saying to the people at the temple. The phrase is, Pollen, again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. There were no chapter or verse divisions in the ancient manuscripts of the New Testament, and there's no hint that something is missing in those most ancient manuscripts. There's no big space or hole or other such thing. The text continues seamlessly, and the story of the woman taken in adultery is simply not there. Consider the ancient sources that do not include this passage. The Bodmer Papyri, P66 and P75, both of them from around 200, do not contain the story. In fact, no papyrus until manuscript cataloged contains the passage, but most of the papyri are fragmentary and do not have this part of John's Gospel. That just means that it's all torn away, it's all rotted, and there's, it doesn't exist. The 4th century unsealed manuscript found in St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai by Tischendorf does not contain the passage. The Vatican manuscript, also from the 4th century, does not contain the passage. There is no space left in Vaticanus, but there is an asterisk in the margin which could indicate an awareness of a question at that point. Both Alexandrinus... And Ephraimi Rescriptus, which is manuscript A and manuscript C, seem to be lacking this passage because there does not seem to be adequate space for it, but their poor condition makes certain verification impossible. Unseals N, T, W, L, X, Y, Delta, Theta, C, and 053 and 0141 do not contain the passage. Later cursive manuscripts, which these are unique because they tend to have been copied from better copies dating from the 9th to 15th centuries, do not contain the passage. Old Latin manuscript A, F, L, and Q do not contain the passage. Syriac manuscripts from the older Sinaitic and Curatonian Syriac translations do not contain the passage. Some later Palestinian Syriac manuscripts do not contain the passage. The Sahidic Coptic does not contain it. Some manuscripts of the Bohiric Coptic do not contain it. The Subachmimic Coptic does not contain it. The passage is absent from Gothic, Armenian, and Georgian ancient versions. The passage is absent from 2nd century Father Tatian's Harmony of the Gospels. Citations from Tertullian, Origen, Cyprian, Christosom, Nona Cyril, and Cosmos Theocalac do not include John 7, 53 to 8, 11. See, this is a more full report on a passage. It's not just, this is getting down to all of the evidence. Some Greek biblical manuscripts do include 
the passage in question following John 7, 52. The earliest is the highly aberrant Codex Biza from the 6th century, a manuscript known for many readings found in no other Greek manuscript. Also including the passage are parchment uncials F, G, H, K, M, U, and Gamma, all later, see 9th century or later, and then cursive manuscripts containing the passage after John 7.52 include those, and the majority of late Byzantine manuscripts cataloged. The story is contained in those old Latin manuscripts and uh, go down after the old Latin ones. The story is included after John 7.52 in the Latin Vulgate and in those other things. Now, drop down to the next paragraph. The story of the woman taken in adultery is included to some degree with asterisk or abale in several manuscripts. Codex E includes John 8, 2 through 11 with asterisk. See, not 753 to 811, but 8, 2 through 11. So it includes part of the text with asterisk. Unseals S, Lambda, and P include John 8, 3 through 11. See, it includes even less of the passage, but with asterisk. Later cursive manuscripts, 1077 and 1443 and 1445, also include it with asterisks, meaning there's some question. <coughs> Lectionary 185 from the 11th century includes it, includes 8, 1 through 11. See, I don't know if you're getting this, but some of them include 8, 2 through 11. Some of them include 8, 3 through 11. Some of them include 8, 1 through 11. See, they can't decide how much of it is supposed to be included. And then those other lectionaries at the last of that paragraph include 8, 3 through 11 with asterisks. Some manuscripts include all of John 7, 53 to 8, 11, but in other locations. What do we call that when it can't decide where to light? Floating text. Floating. That's a floating text. <laughs> Cursive manuscripts 1, 118, 131, 209, as well as some of those Armenian manuscripts, include the passage at the end of John's Gospel after John 21, 24. Cursive manuscripts 13, 69, etc., include the passage in Luke's Gospel after Luke 21, 38. Cursive manuscript 225 includes the passage right after John 7.36 in a different spot, see, in the seventh chapter of John. This is a clear example of what Metzger calls a floating text. When scribes were inclined to include something but didn't know where they should put it, they ended up inserting it at various locations so that it floated around in the manuscript tradition. When dealing with the fathers, it is difficult to make decisions because of our text of the church fathers is mostly based on very late manuscripts of those fathers. It is strange that some very early Latin fathers like Tertullian and Cyprian discuss adultery in various texts but never mention this passage. Origen never mentions it in all of his writings. The Eusebian canons almost always omit any reference to the story of the adulterous woman when they list the gospel accounts. There is one manuscript <clears throat> of the Eusebian canons with a part missing, but an extra number may indicate that it was there. <clears throat> John Chrysostom, who was the great preacher at Constantinople in the 4th century, says nothing about it as he preaches through the gospel of John. Why did you do that, John? It's hard to say the diatessera, and that's Tatian's work, is strong evidence against the pericope because although it omits the story, it is based on a 13th or 14th century manuscript in Arabic and Latin. The Didascalia Apostolorum, chapter 7, mentions the story, and though some say the document originated very early, it is actually translated from Syriac manuscript 62 that dates from the 8th or 9th century. The text says, 
do as he also did with her that sinned, whom the elder set before him, and leaving the judgment at his hand, departed. But he, the searcher of hearts, asked her and said to her, Have the elders condemned you, my daughter? He says, she says to him, Nay, Lord. And he said to her, Go your way, neither do I condemn you. Well, see, this is not an exact quote. It's just kind of the story, which indicates that there was this story about this woman, but it likely was not part of the original text. And, it, and as I say there at the end of the paragraph, the text is not exactly like the story in the Textus Receptus, but it certainly is the same story. Eusebius, the 4th century historian of the church, cites the 2nd century writer Papias of Herapolis saying, Papias also put forth another history concerning a woman accused of many sins before the Lord, and this history is contained in the gospel according to the Hebrews. So this shows that there was an old story about this, but not necessarily actually written in the gospel of John. This indicates that the story existed and was circulated very early, but possibly in a non-canonical source, the gospel according to the Hebrews. The story is cited in the apostolic constitutions, According to the introduction in Robertson and Donaldson's Ananicene Fathers, parts of this document are thought to have arisen very early, perhaps in the 3rd century, but again, the document itself is based on manuscripts from the 11th century and later. The text says, And when the elders had said another woman which had sinned before him and had left the sentence to him and were gone out, the Lord, the searcher of hearts, inquiring of her whether the elders had condemned her and being answered no, he said to her, Go thy way. Therefore, for neither do I condemn thee. The 4th century Latin father Ambrose, in Epistle 25, 7, writes, And she responded, et ille responded, Nemo, deceit at Jesus. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Nec ego te damnabo. So it's, it's, it's there in the old Latin of uh, Ambrose. Uh, Pacian of Barcelona says in his epistle, choose not to read in the gospel that the Lord spared even the adulteress who confessed when none had condemned her. This is not a quotation, but a clear indication that he knew the story from a gospel of some kind. Uh, Latin text of Jerome says in the gospel, according to John, in many manuscripts, both Greek and Latin, is found the story of the adulterous woman who was accused before the Lord. Uh, Augustine says, and he says something similar. Drop down to the paragraph after that. There are several reasons why it is highly like, unlikely that the story of the woman taking adultery was part of the Gospel of John. First, the fact that it is completely ag absent in the Greek manuscript tradition before the 6th century makes it doubtful. Then when it does appear, as it does in Codex Bisa, one of the strangest and most aberrant manuscripts, because it has many readings contained nowhere else and is known for its corruption. Bisa is a bilingual manuscript with Latin on one side, Greek on the other. Only part of the passage, John 8, 2 through 11 occurs uh, in Codex E from the 6th or 7th century, but with asterisks. This manuscript does not include John 7.53 or 8.1. Then there are seven 9th and 10th century unseals that contain the whole story. Three 9th and 10th century unseals contain part of the story, and they include it with asterisks, in indicating some kind of suspicion. Even some late cursive manuscripts include part of the story with asterisks, as do a few lectionaries. So to summarize, the story does not appear in the Greek manuscript tradition until the 6th century, and when it does appear, the scribes could not agree on how much of the story to include. And numerous scribes placed asterisks on the story, indicating their suspicions about its authenticity. Equally troublesome is the fact that some scribes could not decide where to put the story whether it's current location after John 7.52 or at the end of John's gospel or right after John 7.36 or even in Luke's gospel. This by itself casts major dispersion or suspicions on the authenticity of the passage. The story is contained in 
eight old Latin manuscripts from the 5th to the 12th centuries and in the Latin Vulgate, showing its strong presence in the Latin tradition beginning in the 5th century. The passage is absent in the earlier Sinaitic and Curatonian Syriac, but present in some manuscripts of the later Palestinian and Harquian Syriac. This also speaks to its late arrival in the tradition. <clears throat> in summary, because of its absence in the early Greek manuscript tradition, because of the confusion about how much of it to include and where it should be positioned in the later Greek manuscript tradition, and because of the presence of many asterisks and oboli in the Greek manuscripts that do include all or portions of the story, it seems obvious that this story was not part of the original gospel. The story seems to originate quite strongly in the Latin tradition of the 5th century. It's a Western reading associated with the Latin church. It is our conclusion that John almost certainly did not write this passage, but it was a traditional story that appeared as a marginal gloss and later was inserted into the text. Since we do not want to be guilty of adding to the inspired text of John's gospel, we recommend that we do not lean on this passage for teaching. The passage is either bracketed or absent in all modern versions except those based on Erasmus's Greek text of the 16th century. See the Bodmer Papyrus below, followed by Vaticanus. So now that's, that's a text-critical paper. How much information is... That paper's not real long, but there's a lot of information in it, right? Tons up. So that's what I really mean when I say I really don't care how long your paper is, but how thick it is, how, how full of good original information it is. If it's full of just fluff and preaching and stuff, I'm just going to go. Okay, but anyway, this is how a text critical paper is supposed to be done when you really cover all the bases and you give the case. But good textual critics can do this with any passage. And they can say, look, this is the real evidence here and what the deal is and why this reading is the way it is. And that's how the readings were come up with in the uh, Greek text as we have it today. So, um, this would be an example of the tendency in the later minuscule tradition to include these ancient marginal notes or traditional stories into the text, like the troubling of the waters in John 5 or, or the uh, story of the woman taken in adultery that sometimes lights in John 8. <clears throat> and also, one of the types of scribal errors that we talked about that we can show in the text is haplography where they look to the side and their, li their eye falls to a, a line that ends or begins in the same way and so they skip or add some text in that way. Okay. <clears throat> so how about we take our five minute break and then we'll proceed with some more. Thanks for the paper, Dan. Oh, there. Oh, there. <laughs> um, guys, did your text that you have for your Greek text, does it have that stuff in the front like his does? Because our, our DBS doesn't. Our, our copy is UBS doesn't. It's stop. <laughs> UBS. All right. Um, this uh, textual commentary that uh, we see right here is a, a helpful thing to go along if you have a question sometime about a reading and it will very shortly summarize the evidence on a reading. It, it looks just like your Greek New Testament. It just has the same kind of a cover. It just says a textual commentary. So if you go over here, for example, to... Uh, the Gospel of John, and we'll go to um, this passage we were talking about. 
Um, you get down here to John seven fifty three to eight eleven, the pericope of the adulteress. See here, mm-hmm. the evidence for the non johannine origin of the pericope of the adulteress is overwhelming. You understand what that means, don't you? It means it doesn't belong. That means it doesn't belong there. And then he gives you the, an explanation in about two pages. He doesn't go into as much detail as I did, but he gives you the explanation for for why that's the case. And he'll give you the explanation on other passages as well. Okay. Now, so these, the reason I give you these on this piece of paper, and I want you to make sure you... Remember these six kinds of errors. Dictography means copying the same thing twice. Haplography means you look away and you miss something. You leave it out. But textual scholars have demonstrated these kinds of errors over and over again in the manuscript tradition. So it's not just about manuscripts. It's about how errors tended to arise and whether you can demonstrate those in these manuscripts. So it's about manuscripts, and it's about the proclivities of scribes. Westcott and Hort were the two scholars that originated this kind of study on the observed proclivities of scribes in the textual tradition. What did scribes tend to do? And uh, these are among the types of things that uh, they observed in many different manuscripts. All right. Um, Along with the manuscripts, there is a quite interesting uh, art tradition, especially in the later medieval manuscripts. These guys that were stuck in these monasteries, they did all kinds of doodling along with their um, copying (coughs) scripts, and uh, copied all kinds of things. One of the manuscripts, Manuscript Gigas, I think, is uh, the one that uh, is a great big manuscript, and it had (laughs) this this dude copied on it. I don't know who he's supposed to be. Maybe he's a monk that had a real wild party and, and ended up like this at the end. I don't know, but... Segmented into a cave and had all those nightmares and stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know, but this this guy's on there and he's skivvies. Another <laughs> art tradition that is quite well evidenced in a lot of the Eastern manuscripts um, and and other medieval illuminated. They're called illuminated manuscripts. Illuminated because there's artistic stuff written in them was the way the apostles looked. Now, this comes long after the time of the apostles. But this is supposed to be Peter, and this is kind of typical for the way Peter was portrayed. And you would have, you know, other authors or gospel writers or whatever portrayed, and there was kind of a way that they were portrayed. You know, sometimes you'd have a page that looks something like this and the text would be copied and then you'd have different people like Mary or wh- whoever. Uh, this is, yeah, this is typically the Eastern Orthodox icons tended to have halos and all those kinds of things. Uh, somebody like Paul, you know, with a little bit of a bald head here. Or maybe Luke, that may be Luke down there that's writing, or John, and God being the one that is the one with the beard. I think this is a typical type of a Luke right here. That's a Luke, probably. All right, so anyway, that's just neither here nor there. So the late minuscule, the late cursive manuscript tradition continued until the year 1450 uh, when the Gutenberg brothers invented the printing press. 
And that changed everything, see? Because the printing press wasn't perfect, but once you set the type, which was very laborious and painstaking, so you'd have to take each little letter that was carved out in wood or metal or something and put it in the tray and <clears throat> set the type in a big page with tray. <clears throat> and that's this press that they invented. You'd, you'd put your plate down there with all of its type set for one page and then you'd roll the ink over it, you know, get it wet with the ink. Uh, you'd put one page down on it and you would <laughs> twist it down until it pressed one page. <clears throat> then you'd <laughs> and you'd take the one page out of there, make sure it was dry and not messy, <clears throat> hang it up on a thingy, <clears throat> make sure your thing was inked, put another page in there and <laughs> So you could print multiple copies of a single page and it would take you a while compared to our copying today. <clears throat> but compared to once you got your typeset, compared to the time it would take to copy by hand, it was much more efficient. So books began to be mass produced in this way. And the first book to be printed was the Latin Bible. Uh, the Latin translation of the Bible in 1456. It's called the Mazarin, M-A-Z-A-R-I-N, Bible. <coughs> M-A-Z-A-R-I-N. <coughs> it's the Latin Vulgate. <clears throat> which was very popular as a translation then <clears throat> in the Catholic Church. And the Greek Bible was printed in 1514 in the Complutensian Polyglot. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But the basic thing is, after this point in time, we quickly get rid of, <clears throat> in history, manuscript Bibles as being the Bibles people used. And we replace those manuscript Bibles with printed Bibles. See, our Bibles today are printed. Even this Greek New Testament is printed. It's not manuscript. It's not done by hand. <clears throat> So, write this down. <clears throat> this is very important. Write down Textus Receptus. T-E-X-T-U-S-R-E-C-E-P-T-U-S. -E -E Textus Receptus. And then put a dash. <clears throat> and then write the printed Greek Testament which was current in the 1500s. <clears throat> the printed Greek New Testament, which was current in the 1500s. Now, after you say 1500s, put a parenthesis <clears throat> and say 16th century. See, the 16th century is the 1500s. The 15th century is the 1400s. <clears throat> All right. This is a page from the Mazarin Bible, that Latin Vulgate, that was the first Bible printed <clears throat> on the Gutenberg Press. <clears throat> Beautiful. And they could print multiple copies of it. <clears throat> Which brings us to this guy. What's that? How did they set the artwork? <clears throat> I don't know. I get the letters, but... 
full color artwork and stuff is kind of interesting. I don't know how they did that. And they had to use colored ink and black ink. Yeah. They had to have done a, a carving, basically, and then inked it and pressed it around the edge of the text. <coughs> Very intricate work. <clears throat> now, each page wouldn't look like this. This would be like a uh, front page of a book or something, and then the rest of them would be just strictly manuscript, you know. <coughs> All right, brings us to this guy, very important guy. Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam. <clears throat> he lived in the late 1400s, early 1500s. I'll tell you his dates in a minute. <clears throat> he was a Catholic scholar who was um, very astute in the languages. And this was during the period where people had begun to read again in the Greek and Hebrew text and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> it was a period following the Crusades. What actually happened was from, from about the 11th through the 13th century, you had Crusades. And the Crusades were going to the Holy Land and they were bringing back all kinds of uh, early books a lot of manuscripts, a lot of uh, information about medicine and astronomy and all these kinds of things. <clears throat> the Arabic doctors were, you know, they were learning all things about medical stuff from the Arabic doctors who were worlds ahead of them. Um, <clears throat> so there was this big uh, explosion of learning in Europe. And Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam was one of those scholars who was studying for himself and learning and going back to the text and reading the Bible in the original languages and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> he was sort of like, in a much smaller way, a Martin Luther type, though not nearly as motivated for Reformation as a, as a Martin Luther. But he was really studying the text. And so it was in the early years of the 1500s that he began to prepare a Greek text from several manuscripts that would be printed and used by people as, as the text to base biblical studies on. <clears throat> so um, the original work on formally composing a complete received text of this uh, had the support of the Roman Catholic Church in uh, 1514 and the New Testament owes much to Erasmus's five Greek editions <clears throat> there is a Darius Erasmus of Rotterdam lived 1469 to 1536 and he was a teacher at Cambridge University during his time in England from 1509 to 1514. <clears throat> it is known that he was working on the first edition of his Greek New Testament during this time. His Greek New Testament was an important element in the Protestant Reformation, but Erasmus himself stayed with the Roman Catholic Church. <clears throat> now, the word textus receptus in Latin just means the received text. And received text just simply means the accepted text, the received text received by us at this present moment in time in history. See? So... It is. It, it was really in the introduction to one of his editions that the printers, which were actually the Elzevir brothers, printers, they said this is the text which is now received by people, and they that in Latin was textus receptum, textum receptum, the text that is received. <clears throat> so that's why it later became called the Textus Receptus. 
Textus Receptus sounds really official. It sounds really holy. It sounds really good. But it just means the form of the Greek text that was accepted by Erasmus and others in the 1500s. <clears throat> and it was printed and popularized in printed form. It became the basis for the translation of the Luther Bible, the German Bible, and for the translation of the New Testament by William Tyndale, and later for the King James Version, and for most other Reformation-era New Testament translations, like the Geneva Bible and others that we'll talk about here shortly. So, um, we're going to talk about this in our next section of the class, but think about this. When you think about a translation and whether it's a good translation, <clears throat> first, you think about two things, well, three things, really. Uh, number one, you think about what is it translated from? What is it translated from? What's the basis of this translation? See, that's a huge part of it right there. <clears throat> Second thing you think about is, is it a, an accurate translation of whatever it's translated from? In other words, if it's based on the modern critical Greek text, which is based on all the 5,000 manuscripts, 6,000 almost manuscripts, is it a good translation of that text? Does it do a good job of bringing the Greek into English? See? <clears throat> if it is a translation of the Textus Receptus, then does it do a good job of translating that Greek text? Okay? So, so you've got, what's it based on? And does it do a good job of translating what it's based on? Number three, is it readable and understandable to the modern reader? Because <clears throat> if the modern reader can't understand it, then it's not worth very much. <clears throat> All right, since I'm presently doing some choking... Jeremiah, read this one for me. This is talking about the Erasmus's editions of the um, Greek New Testament. The series originated with the first printed Greek New Testament to be published, a work undertaken in Basel by the Dutch Catholic scholar and humanist Desiderius Erasmus in 1516 on the basis of some six manuscripts containing between them not quite the whole of the New Testament. The Latin text was translated from Vulgate. All right. So what that means is that Erasmus's printed Greek New Testament, which we call the Textus Receptus, <clears throat> was based on about six, count them, six late minuscule Greek, New Te uh, Greek manuscripts. Six. Now, later, being fair to the majority of people, later, when we discovered more and more and more manuscripts, it became clear that Erasmus's six manuscripts represented fairly well most of the later cursive manuscripts. Did you understand what I just said? Mm -hmm. See, Erasmus only had about six. He was only aware of a very few of them. But now that we are aware of jillions of them, most of the later cursive manuscripts match pretty well with Erasmus's text. <clears throat> this is the 1516 first edition of the... Greek text of Erasmus, which came to be called the Textus 
Receptus. See, it's in book form. It's beautiful. <clears throat> it was the basis for Martin Luther's German translation. <clears throat> I think John Purvey. Was it John Purvey? I think that's right. Was uh, it was maybe that's not the right thing. <coughs> One of Luther's students that usually that actually did most of the translating, I think. Here's another kind of blurry look at the original Textus Receptus. Here's uh, another copy of the Textus Receptus, and and the type was set. You'll notice in minuscule typescript, not in capital typescript, <clears throat> at least in this edition. Again, um, this has Latin text on one side, Erasmus's Greek text on the other side. Again, the definition there, the Textus Receptus was the name given to the printed Greek text based on the late cursive manuscripts. Well, that's Latin on the right. Greek on the left. Now there is a guy named David Otis Fuller who is popular with some people who really think that the King James is the only Bible which you should read. <clears throat> and he has written books like this one, uh, True or False, and like the one in purple, which is called Which Bible? Which Bible should you have? Of course, he thinks all of them are terrible unless they say what the King James says. And very emotional, and he bases a lot of his stuff on the writings of uh, a guy back in the 1800s by the name of John W. Burgeon, B-U-R-G-O-N. <clears throat> but um, it's an outcry that supports the Textus Receptus uh, Greek text. Now I got to read you a little part out of um, Erasmus. This is um, Erasmus uh, out of uh, Metzger. He has uh, he's, he calls it the pre-critical period, the origin and dominance of the Textus Receptus. <clears throat> Let me see if I can find what I want to read to you. Let's see here. All right. Um, all right, here he says, Among the criticisms leveled at Erasmus, one of the most serious appeared to be the charge of Stunica, one of the editors of Zimenez's Complutensian Polyglot, <clears throat> that Erasmus's text lacked the part of the final chapter of 1 John, namely the Trinitarian statement concerning the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth. <clears throat> Erasmus replied that he had not found any Greek manuscript containing these words, though he had in the meanwhile examined several others besides those on which he relied when first preparing his text. So he had prepared his text based on six, but he had found several others and examined them, and it wasn't in any of them either. All right. In an unguarded moment, Erasmus promised that he would insert the uh, passage, the Johannine comma, as it's called, in future editions, if a single Greek manuscript could be found that contained the passage. At length, such a copy was found or was made to order. 
As it now appears, the Greek manuscript had probably been written in Oxford about 1520 by a Franciscan friar named Froy or Roy, who took the disputed words from the Latin Vulgate. Erasmus stood by his promise and inserted the passage in his third edition in 1522, but he indicates in a lengthy footnote his, his suspicions that the manuscript had been prepared expressly to confuse him. Among the thousands of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament examined since the time of Erasmus, only three others are known to contain this spurious passage. They are manuscript 88 from the 12th century that has the comma written in the margin in a 17th century hand. Manuscript 110 from the 16th century and manuscript 629 dating from the 14th century or the latter half of the 16th century. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, that was the story I was telling you earlier about that. Let me see if I have what I want in here. Nope, that's not what I want. Hang on just a minute. I'm going to switch... to my other file here. That's not what I want. Where is he? Where is he? Wait a minute. I'm going to find him. I bet I skipped him in that other one. Let's see. Okay, wait a minute. I know I've got this somewhere. Hmm. Interesting. This is really interesting class for all of you that are watching out there on the internet. How did Erasmus deal with the differences in the six Greek texts he was using? Are you going to get to that? Well, there weren't very many differences. Okay. Uh, he did have one older manuscript, Alexandrinus, that he was aware of, but he didn't really use it because he huh. thought, eh, it's not enough like these others for me to use it. Uh, he, he depended on the later ones instead of the earlier ones. Well, I'll find it, but I have a copy of the of the section in in First John where um, his first edition does not have the edition, but his third edition oh. does have it, and I've got a photograph of both of those. Okay, so let's see here. Let's go back to that other file. What am I doing? I must have closed one out. What we want to do now here for a few minutes, can you see this or not? Can you see on the screen the, the figures here? Yeah, 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 they're discernible. All right, so what I want to do is I want to show you this reading here, and I want to give you an example of the type of thing I'm going to give you on your test. <clears throat> All right, so 
I want you to at least know the basics here. Um, I would like you to be able to identify um, which are uncials, which are minuscules, etc. And I'm going to give you some info here about that. Um, see where the Hebrew letter Aleph is right there after the first reading where the star is. With uh, It has a little asterisk by it. Can you tell? Is that what the Aleph is, that funky thing? Yes. Yeah, the Aleph is the Hebrew letter that means manuscript Sinaiticus, found at Mount Sinai, see? Then right mm -hmm. after the Aleph with the asterisk, you've got capital A. Okay. That's Alexandrinus, manuscript Alexandrinus from the 5th century. Then you've got capital B. Capital B is manuscript Vaticanus from the 4th century. Capital C is manuscript Ephraimi Rescriptus, etc. So <clears throat> those are all unseal, parchment unseal manuscripts. Now when you get to number 33 and 81 <coughs> without a zero in front of them, what kind are those? Minuscule. Minuscule or cursive. Now, do you see the little IT that's after 1881? Yes. All right. And then if you drop down into the next reading, about one, two, three, four lines down at the very first of the line, you'll see another IT right there with some superscripts. Uh -huh. All right. Write down that little IT means Old Latin. Old Latin. It with a little I and a little T means Old Latin. Old Latin. And then if you look at the first reading up at the top line, you have Old Latin, and then it has a, a superscript of an F and a G right there after the IT. Do you see it or not? Yes. All right. If you can't see it, get next to a TV where you can see it. All right. So the superscript means those are the actual old, lit, old Latin manuscripts that support that reading. So Old Latin Manuscript F and Old Latin Manuscript G support that first reading, that shorter reading. Now, if you drop down to the fourth line, at the first of the line, you'll see that several other Old Latin manuscripts, Old Latin Manuscript AR, Old Man Latin Manuscript C, D, D-E-M, D-I-V, E-M-O-N, X, and Z, all of those support the next reading. Are you with me or not? Yep. Drew, are you with me? Trying. Okay. Do you need to get where you can see that back TV or something? It's blurred. The back it's TV blurred. is? Yep. Uh, it's not that bad. It's from this okay. direction. Okay. I can read it easier than one up there. Oh, I can't. All remember. right. So, so I big big thing is IT is old Latin. And then the superscript is which manuscripts of the Old Latin? <clears throat> All right. Old Latin is a version. What do I mean by a version? Translation. Yeah, it's not the Greek text. It's a translation of the Greek text into Old Latin. All right. Then in the top reading up there, you have S-Y-R. You see it? S-Y-R. That means Syriac, the Syriac version. <clears throat> now you see the, the manuscript on the left here is a Syriac manuscript. S-Y-R. All right, so then after the S-Y-R, it says P-A-L as a superscript. P-A-L means Palestinian Syriac. And then it says MS, meaning one manuscript 
of the Palestinian Syriac supports this reading. But basically, I'm not going to get that detailed with you probably on this. I'm just going to want you to know that SYR means Syriac, and there are different kinds of Syriac manuscripts. This is the Palestinian. All right, then after that you have COP. That's Coptic, Coptic. See, the Nag Hammadi documents were Coptic. They were in the language of Egypt, Coptic. Coptic is a language that uses some Greek characters, but it's not Greek. It's the language of the Egyptians, Coptic. And there are two types of Coptic manuscripts that the superscripts represent, Sahidic and Bohiric Coptic. And I don't think you have to know that for the test, so don't worry about it. Um, ARM, this is my ARM, but it also means Armenian, Armenian, A-R-M-E-N-I-A-N. -E Armenian is a version, a language, a translation in, in ancient times. <clears throat> so see, after the Greek manuscript evidence, we've got Latin evidence, we've got Syriac evidence, we've got Coptic evidence, we've got Armenian ev evidence go to the second line, you have Ethiopic, E-T-H. We have a lot of Ethiopic manuscripts. Those are African, early African translations, Ethiopic. Then we have a couple of church fathers and their quotation of this passage that supports it, Ambrosiaster and Euthalius. And then you've got that double slash, that double slash right there, like on the computer, see it? That means this is the end of the evidence for that first reading, and it's the beginning of the evidence for another reading. See, the first reading is just humon, period. The second reading is humon amen, with an amen. Well, big deal, it doesn't change anything, but, but it's a different reading. So the second reading adds the amen. I've got stars by the first and second reading. And then if you go all the way down to the bottom at the end of the fourth line, you'll see another double slash. And you'll see that it says humon pantote amen. And it adds the word always. Amen. Which is sort of a growing text there, see? But... Uh, then it gives you one manuscript that supports that reading. All right, so go, go back to the second reading after the first double slash there where it says, Humon, Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes. All right. Then you'll notice, and this is important, compare the Aleph here with the Aleph up at the beginning. How can we have manuscript Aleph supporting both readings? Well... The reason is, the first Aleph has an asterisk beside it, which means the original hand of manuscript Sinaiticus, the original copier of Sinaiticus, does it this way. The second Aleph has a little C beside it. That means a later corrector, quote-unquote, of the manuscript. So a later scribe came back and, quote, corrected the manuscript by adding the amen. But see, we have questions on whether he really corrected it or whether he added something that somebody else had added. See what I'm saying? But the C... Like if you had the, the capital letter B and then a C out beside it, that would mean the corrector or a corrector of manuscript B. But if you had B with an asterisk there, it would mean the original scribe of Vaticanus. Say that again. So the if, if, so the if, with the 
If a capital letter, listen, if a capital letter has an asterisk beside it, it means the original scribe of that manuscript put it this way. But if a capital letter has a C out beside it, that means a later corrector had it this way. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> look in the second reading on the third line of the reading there. It's actually the fourth line of this whole thing here. You'll see after it lists all those old Latin manuscripts, it has a VG. Mm, yeah. Can you see the VG? Yes. Little, little V, little G right there after those on fourth line. If you can't see it, it won't mean anything to you. All right, I see it. Now. Yep, I see it. All right, that means Vulgate. That is Jerome's revision of the Latin. See, before Jerome in the 4th, 5th century, uh, there were the old Latin manuscripts, the old Latin version that had, had all these kinds of variations in it, but it was around for a long time. In the late 300s or whatever it was, Jerome kind of pulled all the Latin stuff together and made a revision, made a, a, a version, a translation, sort of like the, the King James of, of Latin for his time. And it was called the Latin Vulgate. After that time, Latin translations that followed Jerome are called the Vulgate. Okay? The Vulgate became the standardized translation for the Catholic Church. Okay? So VG just means the Latin Vulgate. And all the copies of the Latin Vulgate basically read this way. Then you've got some Syriac manuscripts there that read that way. And you've got Coptic manuscripts, Bohiric Coptic manuscripts. And then you have G-O-T-H. That doesn't mean, that G-O-T-H doesn't mean they wore black vests and black makeup and had piercings in their nose. That's not what it means. It means the Gothic version of the New Testament. There were, there were two missionaries very early in time, <clears throat> back like the 300s or 400s or something, and their names were Cyril and Methodius. You've often heard the Russian alphabet called the Cyrillic alphabet. Cyrillic. That's because Cyril and Methodius, these two missionaries who spoke Greek and Latin, they went to the, to the tribes of the Goths, which were the same people as the yeah, out of which some of the Ukrainian and, and Russian and all those kind of peoples came. And those people did not have a written language. They only had a verbal language. And so Cyril and Methodius created a language for them out of Greek characters and other characters. And that language was called Gothic. So there were some early manuscripts... <coughs> that were translations into the Gothic language that we still have. Now, you know, you think about the fall of the Roman Empire um, in 476. You know, you had the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and all these other Goths. That's the Gothic translation. Whether they killed all the Roman people or not, they still made them a Bible translation. All right, so then you had you have Chrysostom and Cassiodorus as fathers there. So what I want you to be able to do is, like, for example, if I were to ask you, for example, look at this, how many unseal manuscripts support the first reading? Six. One, two, three, four, five, seven. 
How many say eight? Five. You got six. You got six? Why did you say six instead of five? Um, well, I kind of assign Atticus, and then A, B, C, and, uh, no, yeah, A, B, C, and G, and then 0, 48. Yeah, big 0, 48. Any, any number with a 0 in front of it is also an unsealed manuscript. So you're correct. You would have got that one right. All right, now, what if I were to ask you how many old Latin manuscripts support the first reading? Looks like two. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Um, is it the first reading or the second reading that has the support of the Armenian version? First one. The first one. That's right. All right. Then if I were to ask you how many minuscule manuscripts support the first reading and how many minuscule manuscripts support the last reading? Looks like three for the first for and the then first. 18 for the second. No, I'm talking about the last one, the last reading. There's three readings. One, uh, one. one on the, on yeah, the last one. One on the last one, that's right. <clears throat> so um, I would ask you this question. Which reading is supported by the majority of Byzantine manuscripts? This second one. Yep, the second one. That's correct. All right, so I think you've got it pretty well. Oh, one thing I didn't explain to you. Um, in the third line of this thing, at the very end of the line, you have L-E-C-T. Yeah. That means lectionaries. Lectionaries. Lectionaries are Greek manuscripts of selected readings. Lectionaries were like readings for Sunday, the second Sunday in October, readings for the third Sunday in October, readings for the fourth Sunday in October, and they might be a little piece of the Gospels and a little piece of Paul's epistles or something like that. They weren't like continual manuscripts of Ephesians or Galatians or something. They were just little selected readings. And so what that is saying with the capital L-E-C-T is that most of the lectionaries that we have, which are later in date, they, they support this reading as well. And a lectionary was a selected reading for like a, a church service? Right. You, you've heard of the... Um, What's the the liturgy of the church, you know, like the the ordered service. And as time went by, there were certain gospel readings and readings from Paul and stuff that were read on the various Sundays of the year. And th that's what lectionaries are. They're actual Greek manuscripts, but they're readings for the churches in the Byzantine part of the empire. Okay. Now, let's look at another one here real quick. Mind if I ask you a quick question about the Latin material? Yep. When you're looking at it, it seems like the Vulgate, Jerome's Vulgate, is, as you were saying, kind of like the King James of the Old Latin. Is that correct? Yeah, it's like the Old Latin was around before the Vulgate, and it was very diverse. And they kind of swept it together and made a standard translation. Okay, so which one is preferred? Is it preferred to have the support from the Vulgate or support from the Old Latin? Um, well, it's not that easy. Um, okay. The, the, some of the Old Latin goes back way further than the Vulgate does. And so even though it's diverse, it gives you, well, this reading was around earlier. 
kind of thing. So okay. it's more complicated than that. Yeah. All right. Let's have a good chapel, and I'll have me a good some soup, and then we'll come nice. back together. Hey, how many of you guys are going to want copies of Dan's TV show? I think I would. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think. Yeah. I think that the cost is like 20 bucks for an extra copy of the, I don't know, I, I think it's 20 bucks. Covering this stuff? Uh, no. What are you talking about? Dan's TV show. His TV show TV called TV Discussions, TV. where he, I asked him if he had done any debate, and he was like, not officially, but I've been on this show called Discussions. Oh, the one that you're, you're putting on? Yeah. Okay. I just, I just don't know if anybody's going to want. Um, I'll probably skip, actually. Okay. How much? I was thinking we're talking about something else. <laughs> okay, you guys, let us get started here again. Uh, let's turn our Bibles for a second to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We're talking about um, some of these textual variants and the way the text of the New Testament was copied and so forth. <clears throat> so, um, let's start with the first verse here, and I'm going to read from the critical Greek text. It says, uh, after these things was the feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Verse 2, <clears throat> now there is in Jerusalem, near the sheep gate, a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethzatha, having five covered porticos. In these, there was lying a multitude of sick people, blind people, lame people, and withered people. And there was a certain man who had been there 38 years in his illness. And when Jesus saw this man lying there, Knowing that he'd already been there so long a time, he said to him, do you want to get well? Well, if you're reading the King James, New King James tradition, uh, you read some other ad added stuff there, right? Mm -hmm. And read me what it says in the additional stuff there. Read me verse... Uh, Three and four in yours, whoever's got it. Is it Aaron or Ben that's got it? <clears throat> yeah, I've got the New King James. Read it for us. So starting in verse three. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. All right. So um, waiting for the moving of the waters is the, is the um, part that starts the addition. All right. So uh, if you go down later in the passage, there's a part of this that isn't in question in the text. <clears throat> if you go down to um, starting in verse 7. Starting in verse 7, the sick man answered, Lord, um, I don't have anyone, whenever the water is troubled, to put me in the pool. Uh, for while I am getting there, another gets down before me. And Jesus said, take up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and he took up his pallet, and he began to walk. Well, so here you have in verse 7 a reference to the troubling of the waters. So this, this uh, uh, pool did have bubbles coming up in it or something like that. That's certainly part of what the, what the text says. Uh, <clears throat> If you go back to um, the verse where it um, starts here, if, if you go back there to verse number three at the end of the verse, let's 
look at our um, apparatus here. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, it's kind of big. All right. Let's see. Let's start right here. Let's zero in. Now the last the last word I uh, read was the word withered or uh, you know yours may translate it a different way. Mine says sick, blind, lame, and what what do you have after sick, blind, and lame? Paralyzed. Okay. Um, <laughs> In other passages, it's translated like if a person has a withered hand or something, it's translated withered, but maybe it can mean paralyzed. But anyway, this is the, uh, this is the word. Let me show you in my text up a little higher here. If I can get to it. Where, where's that finger? Right there. That's the word. Seron, with a four and five footnote after it. So if you come down to footnote four... This says, a reading, that means they're sure of it, that this should be the reading. It should end right there with withered or paralyzed. And P66 and P75 are two very early papyrus manuscripts, papyrus unseals, the oldest ones we have that just stop right there. <clears throat> then you've got Sinaiticus. Then you've got Alexandrinus with an asterisk. What does that mean? It's the original. original hand. Yeah, the original scribe here of Alexandrinus has stops it right there. Then you've got Vaticanus. Then you've got Ephraimi Rescriptus with an asterisk. What does that mean? The original hand. The original hand. See, and then you've got this uh, Unseal and this unseal, and then you've got an old Latin manuscript and a Syriac manuscript and uh, some manuscripts of the Sahidic and Bohiric Coptic and two manuscripts of the Achmimic Coptic and Tatian's Diatestron. All of those support the short reading. <clears throat> then you've got a double slash, which means we've got another possibility here. And so the other possibility, the second reading is, it goes... Uh, withered people, see here's the same word, uh, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the waters. And that's Codex Biza from the 6th century and a bunch of old Latin manuscripts right there. And one Georgian, that's like Georgia in Russia manuscript or two of them. Then you've got another double slash, which means uh, another possible reading. Instead of adding the word paralyzed, paralytics, it says withered people waiting for the moving of the waters. So you have two different versions of it. And this has the second corrector of Alexandrinus, the third corrector of Ephraimi Rescriptus. See, these are people that came along later centuries and made, quote, corrections. Codex Corridithi, Codex Washingtonianus. Um, all right. And some of these. All right. There's more evidence for this one in the later unseals. Then you've got, where is it? Okay, that's the rest of verse 3. Then you have footnote 5 says omit verse 4. In other words, it shouldn't be in the text. <clears throat> that would follow these manuscripts. Wow. What's this one? What's this one mean right here? VG. The Vulgate. Vulgate. The Vulgate. That's right. And the Coptic and Syriac and all those. Now here's the, here's the double slash. Include verse 4. And here's some new words. For an angel of the Lord. Um, and it continues over here. 
or an angel of the Lord. Where do we go? Okay, here it is. At times came down in the pool. All right. <clears throat> now, let me see if I can show you this. These manuscripts say sometimes a kata chiron came down in the pool. All right. And then you have this manuscript that says at a time came down in the pool. It's worded a little differently. And then um, it, there's some manuscript here that has a different verb for coming down in the pool. Uh, then you have another set of readings that says at sometimes uh, disturbed the pool, so it's not worded the same way again. Um, uh, let's see here. So basically what you have here is the ones that have it. Let me see if I can widen out a little bit. <clears throat> the ones that have it can't agree on how it should be worded. See, they, they have different versions of it. They have different wording of it here. So it's not consistent. The ones that do have it in these later manuscripts, they don't have it the same way. All right? <clears throat> and all of these are different variations that, that go with this. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so let's see what uh, Metzger says. <coughs> Excuse me, in the uh, textual commentary, if I can find it here. What did I do with that textual commentary? I know I had it here just a few minutes ago. Where did you go? <coughs> there he is. Metzger will sort of summarize this probably. This is chapter 5 of John, isn't it? Uh -huh. <clears throat> All right. Um, he says, verse 4 is a gloss, meaning it's a note, whose secondary character is clear from its absence from the earliest and best witnesses. Uh, then he says... The presence of asterisks and oboli to mark the words as spurious in more than 20 Greek witnesses, including these. Then he says also the presence of non johannine words or expressions. John doesn't use these expressions in his writings. <clears throat> and, number four, the rather wide diversity of variant forms in which the verse was transmitted. In other words, the ones that have it can't agree on how it's supposed to be. So all of this to a text critic says, verse 4 is a gloss, meaning it wasn't part of the original, it was added later and they couldn't decide how it was supposed to be. All right, so... Metzger really helps to summarize the evidence in a way that you can understand it. <clears throat> so, let's back up to the story in John just real quickly. Um, so, what's the deal with the actual story in John? Well, the actual story in John, as it's written in the critical text in most of the early manuscripts, is that... This was a pool, sort of like a, um, <clears throat> it had, at times, the water bubbled in it for some reason. People thought the pool was therapeutic. They thought it was good to get in it and take the, take the water, sort of like they do at Thermopolis and uh, the hot, hot springs in Thermopolis or in that, what is that place, Hot Springs, Arkansas? You know, places like that. Um, and uh, according to tradition of, of uh, Jerusalem in that day, uh, this pool being near the uh, sheep markets was uh, oftentimes tinged in a pink color. 
And the real reason for that was because the blood of all the slaughter of the sheep that ran underneath the city colored the pool with blood, blood pink. Hmm. And so people thought there was healing power in the water, so they were going to try to get in the pool. But the real point in John's gospel is that the hope for getting well is not in the pool. All those sick people thought their hope was in that pool. But their hope was not in the pool. Their hope was in Jesus Christ, see? So Jesus asked the guy, do you want to get well? In verse 6. And of course, that is a question in the Gospel of John that he's really asking all of us. Do you want to get well? And the, the answer is that the only person that can make us well is Jesus, the great physician. See, he's the only one that can make us well. So the answer wasn't in the water. The answer was Jesus. Now, God never has worked, you know, first one in gets healed. God has never worked that way. Never. I mean, you can compare that with all the rest of Scripture. That doesn't match anything anywhere in Scripture. And that's the spurious verse that says, first one that jumped in got healed, everybody else got left out. Um, no. So the point was, these were a bunch of hopeless people that were grasping at straws to do anything that could help with their health, they thought, when the real answer was walking among them, and that was Jesus. Jesus is the person that makes men well. And, and there's a sickness that goes deeper than regular sickness, and that's, that's the one we really ought to be worried about anyway. But that's for another class called the Gospel of... John. John. <clears throat> All right, so... Let me, let me make a couple of comments here about textual criticism. Um, let me see even if I might be able to surf a little bit here on this machine. I may not be able to, we'll see. But let's just see if perhaps it will Google for me a little bit. He don't want to. Well, how many of you um, ha ha are ever on the internet or on Facebook and you run into a site called Gospel Preachers? Yeah. 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 And yeah. Do, do some of you, there's, a, there's another site that's kind of related to that. It's called uh, Greek Studies or Greek Studies for mem Ministers and Churches of Christ or something like that. Anybody familiar with that? <clears throat> That's on Facebook? Yeah. It's kind of a closed group. But anyway, there's a certain one of our schools of preaching that's sort of highly represented in that number of people. And they're very pro-King James, you know. And they're always touting the... Uh, the uh, um, the uh, virtues of the Textus Receptus as the text we ought to follow and everything like that. <clears throat> and they make a lot of comments on there. But a lot of their comments are not very well informed with, with the whole picture. So um, you need to be careful about being taken in uh, with those comments. Um, the fact of the matter is the entire scholarly world is examining the scientific evidence of the nearly 6,000 manuscripts we have, and they're in virtual agreement. You know, there's a couple of weirdos in there that don't, but the evidence points to the fact that the critical Greek text that is represented in the UBS or the latest version of Nestle's uh, is about 99 point something something percent accurate to the original. And that's really not a matter of faith, that's a matter of science. So, so we have an extremely 
accurate Greek text of the New Testament. Not because of professional scribes like the Hebrews had with the Masora, but because of the sheer mass of physical evidence we have for the text from all over the world and from all different centuries of time and everything, that we can, we can with very close to certainty, uh, restore the text of the New Testament, which is what we have in this printed Greek Bible. Now, the amazing thing is, and this is truly providential, that even though Erasmus and company only had about six manuscripts, the amazing thing is that the majority text, what we would call today the Textus Receptus, was still about 95% accurate to the original, which is incredible. And most of the variant readings in the majority text <clears throat> don't change anything about what the text actually uh, means. For example, this one that we were looking at, the difference between humon, which means of you, and humon amen, of you amen, or of you always, amen. I mean, there's no, there's no difference in meaning. There's no change. There's nothing that makes any difference here. If this was the reading or that was the reading. Or like in the end of the Gospel of Luke, it says blessing God or blessing and praising God. What difference does it make? It doesn't change the meaning of the passage. It doesn't change what we teach. Um, he works all things or God works all things. That doesn't change the meaning of the text. It doesn't change the doctrine that we teach. There are these very few exceptions that really don't change much either. They just are marginal glosses that got in, like the confession of the eunuch, which that same thing could be taught from other passages. The, uh, the, the uh, woman taken in adultery, you know, that's a marginal gloss. But that's all included in this 5% variance, see? So, really, there's anybody that wants to read the King James and do what it says is going to go to heaven. And the same is true with those that read the, some of the more modern translations that are based on the critical Greek text. So it's not a matter of bad text and good text. It's a matter of 95% accurate text versus 99 point something 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 percent accurate Greek text see so I think it's my opinion based on years of studying this that it's a no-brainer that we ought to choose the most accurate Greek text we possibly can because we believe that every word of the original was inspired by God so we need to have as accurately as possible what God said. That having been said, the Textus Receptus is still 95% accurate, and it's not going to steer you wrong about anything doctrinally. So it's not an issue that needs to be a central issue among us. It doesn't need to be something that we fight over or split churches over. So, if I was you and the people where you're going prefer the King James or the New King James, I'd just use the New King James and go on about my business. But in the process of, uh, of uh, teaching and educating people over time, uh, maybe you can gradually teach them a little bit better on that. But there are more important things like how they live their lives and their moral conduct and their faithfulness to God other than just those types of things. Okay, <clears throat> another <clears throat> <clears throat> another class of um, uh, information I want you to consider is the uh, quotations of the fathers that support the uh, text of the New Testament. If you look at this <clears throat> reading up here, we've got... Uh, in the third line, at the end of the line, we've got Theophilus, Clement, Origen. Um, according to some Greek man manuscripts, 
Origen, some Latin manuscripts according to Origen, Athanasius, Basil, Chrysostom, Jerome according to some Greek manuscripts, Theodoret, Antiochus, John of Damascus, Pseudo-Ecumenicus, Theophylact. These are all church fathers that, that quote uh, this particular passage and have a certain <clears throat> reading here. Now, we said before that if, if we didn't have a single Greek manuscript, uh, we could almost reconstruct the New Testament by quotations from the church fathers. So evidence from the church fathers is important. But here's the problem when it comes to evidence from the church fathers. And this is important if you're ever going to discuss this with somebody. The textual evidence, for example, that we have for the writings of Jerome. See, Jerome is actually an ancient document written in manuscript form. So what what actual manuscripts do we have of Jerome's writings? Well, what you'll usually find when you study the actual writings of the church fathers in Greek or Latin is that the only manuscripts that we really have that still exist of this writer's writings date from like the 11th, 12th, 13th, 15th century. So even though we have Jerome, who lived in the 4th century, the manuscript copies of Jerome that we have are from the 11th or 12th century. And you'll find that usually across the board for these church fathers. So what happens is you have to do textual criticism all over again with the writings of the church fathers, just like you have to do with the New Testament. So when you're, when you're using church father support for a particular reading, you have to ask, but how much manuscript support do we have for that church father? Am I making myself clear or not? Yeah, the church father lived earlier, but the only evidence we have is much later. Yeah, in other words, just like we have manuscripts of the New Testament, we have manuscripts of the writings of that church father. But the manuscripts that we have of the fathers are usually much later. And a good argument can be made that the later editions of that church father have been adapted to the later condition of the biblical text when they were quoting uh, biblical texts, see? So, <clears throat> anyway, that's something that you have to consider when you're looking at textual evidence. So the strongest evidence for a reading is the Greek manuscript evidence. And there are basically three categories of Greek manuscripts. There are the papyrus unseals, which are the very oldest ones. Then there are the parchment unseals, which are the second oldest. And then there are the minuscules or cursives, which all date after the blank century. Nine all date after the 9th century, and most of them are much later than that. Okay? So, the real evidence that, that mostly solves the issue is the Greek textual evidence. Other secondary evidence, secondary evidence, is the versional evidence, which means what, Aaron? That is... The scriptures translated into a different language. Yeah, other translations of the Bible, like Armenian and Coptic and Gothic and Syriac and all those. <clears throat> and the patristic evidence, which means what? Is that, is that the church fathers? <laughs> yeah, the evidence from the church fathers. That's exactly right. So primary evidence is the original language evidence, the Greek text of the New Testament, the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. Secondary evidence includes the versions and the quotations from the church fathers. Versions? <clears throat> 
versions, meaning translations, and the quotations from the church fathers. Now, on this one, <clears throat> on this one, I want you to answer primary, versional, or patristic. Patristic means church fathers. So, like when we look at manuscript Vaticanus right here, what kind of evidence is that? That's going to be secondary. No. Um, that's primary. That's primary because Vaticanus is a Greek unseal manuscript. What about when we look at manuscript 326 right here? Primary or secondary? Primary. Primary, that is Greek cursive evidence. What about when we get down here to, I lost my mouse, there he is. When we get over here to this old Latin group of manuscripts, what kind of evidence is that? That's going to be secondary. Secondary, and not only secondary, but what else? Versional. Versional, Versional that's right. What about when we get down here to the SYR? What kind is that? Versional. Versional. Yep, secondary, versional. What about when we get over here to Clement of Alexandria? Patristic. Pat patristic, there you go, see? And both versional and patristic are primary or secondary? Secondary. Secondary. I think they've got it. <clears throat> I think they've got it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Where was the notation there for Vaticanus? Vaticanus is capital B. Capital B, okay. Alexandrinus, capital A, Sinaiticus, Aleph. This is depending on whether you're in Paul or the Gospels, Biza or Claromontanus. And this is Mount Athos Lore. You know, there's... Each of these has a history. You don't have to know the names of all of these. You probably ought to know Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and Alexandrinus. Okay. <clears throat> also, you know, when you're looking at church fathers, not all church fathers are equal because some church fathers are earlier in date than others. Obviously, the earlier ones are important, especially if we have a relatively early text of those fathers. All right, <clears throat> um, this is an example of uh, a quotation from Irenaeus of Lyons, probably 180 AD, uh, where Irenaeus is talking about Christ, and he's quoting from the Gospel of John. Um, he exists in the bosom of the Father for no man, he says, has seen God at any time unless the only begotten Son of God which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Well, if you look in your Bible at John 1.18, look in your Bible at John 1.18. Read me John 1, 18 in yours there, Ben. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. All right, so you see the quotation here on the screen from Irenaeus. You can clearly see that he's trying to quote from John 1, 18 as you read this passage. All right, so... Again, in, in the time of Irenaeus, there were no chapters and verses. So he doesn't say John 1.18. He just quotes the words out of the Gospel of John, which we know as John 1.18. Okay. <clears throat> and you have over and over and over and over again this type of phenomenon in the church fathers. So if we want to compare what we know about the text of John 18 to the text of uh, John 1.18 to the text of Irenaeus, we can say, well, yeah, Irenaeus was reading a text pretty much like the one we've got at John 1.18. <clears throat> and by the way, 
um, there is a series of uh, there's a series of critical texts of the church fathers which we used to have to work with. It's called Patrologica Graeca. You don't have to write that down. It just means the Greek fathers. And the, the text of Irenaeus is in Greek. So since it's in Greek, and you can compare the Greek text of Irenaeus with the Greek text of John, that makes really good uh, comparison. Then the Latin fathers, some of the Latin fathers, of course, you know, they originally wrote in Latin. And that's called Patrologica Latinae, the Latin fathers. And they have the Latin text that you compare with the Greek text or whatever. So <clears throat> there's a lot involved with all this stuff, which I don't spend my time worrying about it usually. I know some about it because I've studied this, teaching this class for years and years. But I don't spend my days and nights worrying about this stuff because I'm preaching the word and trying to help people go to heaven. But I know what to say when somebody asks me about this stuff. And I'm trying to get you up to the point where you can at least talk to some people who have questions in all these areas. All right, so I know we go 90 miles an hour sometimes, so let's just take a <sighs> breath here. And let's see what questions some of you may want to ask about some of the stuff we've covered today, just stuff that you've thought of that, what about this or what about that? I had some of those, but they went away. We helped answer them as we talked about things, maybe? No, they just got shoved out because there was more information. Yeah. Okay. So I was like, well, it must not be important. The great See, split of hope. And, and one of the problems, one of the problems in this class is I'm throwing so much new information at you, just you know, in piles. It's hard to digest a lot of this. Go ahead, brother Jeremiah. Uh, about the notes that you gave us about uh, reading the textual apparatus and understanding it, uh, I had those in a separate document because you said this is for the test. And when you say that, I go to a separate document. Are you going to want that information in our notebook as well? Sure, sure. And I was just telling you that one of the things I want to teach you in the transmission section of this class is just kind of basically at the very most basic level of how to take a look at the footnote in the Greek New Testament and have some appreciation of the evidence that supports those different kinds of readings. You can say, okay, it's supported by some of the oldest papyri and some unseals and some of these others, and, uh, you know, I, I just want you to be able to decipher to a little degree what's in that footnote down there. Aaron, do you have a hand up? Yes, sir. When it comes to the authenticity of the church fathers, their writings, I suppose one could look at the manuscripts from the time that the church fathers were writing in and compare their quotations with the manuscripts that we have from that time period and then compare it with the manuscripts from the time period that the manuscript was actually copied in and see kind of who influenced who. Uh, are you familiar with any work that has been done in that area? Not really. You're right, but... For most of us, like in preaching, that takes us into so much deep water, so far away from the from the uh, business of what we're really about, that to really get any good at it, you'd have to waste a lot of time at it. That's the way I look at it. But yeah. there are some people, and, and I'll tell you who one of them would be, Everett Ferguson, who is... Uh, uh, quite aged right now and is a is an expert in the church fathers dr everett ferguson mm -hmm. uh, wonderful wonderful kind man he is extremely knowledgeable in the church fathers in the original languages and stuff and he would know about that kind of thing but as far as me i don't know squat about that kind of thing okay but you at least grasp the complexity of it, because 
when when you cite here's what the church father says you have to then ask the question how much actual textual evidence do we have for the text of that church father right so it's more complicated than that and a lot of times these guys that that hawk the the uh, Texas Receptus, they don't say that. They don't go into that when they cite some evidence from a church father. They say, well, Jerome says, but they don't tell you that the only manuscript they've got which supports that is from the 13th century or something. Yeah. So anyway, anybody else want to bring up anything we've talked about here? Yep. Some of the some of the symbols. Yep. Uh, you showed us one that had a C superscript. Yeah, that, that, that meant a correct. The asterisk is original. C is copier. Correct. Corrector. Uh, a corrector. But now they might say C. they might say C two. That means the second corrector. So so there, so there were some that just had a numeral superscript. Yeah. Without the C. That just means the second corrector. Yeah, well. yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can find an example of this back here in an actual manuscript. <clears throat> Oops, backwards, backwards, backwards. All right, here's a good one. Do you see um, right below the white part? Killing me. Do you see right before the right below the white part and the line ends and right under there you can see something written in between the lines right there? Yes. Mm -hmm. See, that's a corrector that's come in there and said, wait a minute, and he put something else in there. But obviously, see, that's not the original hand that wrote the manuscript. That's somebody in a later century that came on. So so what it would do is this is I think this is like uh, manuscript uh, Sinaiticus or Vaticanus one. you would have Vaticanus with an asterisk, which would be the big capital letters, and then you would have that other word there, and it would say Vaticanus with a C1 or something like that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So this, this is actually seeing it with your eyeballs, how it looks. And that probably that, quote, corrector from a later century said, wait a minute, it's supposed to read this way, isn't it? And so he goes back to this older manuscripts and he writes what his later manuscript says right there. Okay, I was going to see if I could find you another example of it. So the higher the numerical value there, the more suspect it would become of the number. Yeah, well, it, it simply it simply means it, it depends, but it simply means like the second or third corrector that that there was confusion in the textual tradition, and these guys were trying to make it like whatever they thought it should be. Okay. And o only people who really know the real history of manuscripts and their dates could could sort that out. Well, I don't see any other ready, readily available examples here. Here's one. Can you see, this is the uh, confession that, of the eunuch in Codex Laudianus from, this is manuscript capital E from the 6th or 7th century. But on the Latin side, over there on the Latin side, you see where there's a strike through and a correction right there? Yeah. Yeah. So see that would be that would be IT and it would have have the little uh, E, little E for Laudianus, and then it would have a C out beside it, corrector or something like that. Wow. So that that would be like one, two, like three different levels of superscription or four something like that yeah <laughs> wow. but people people that study this stuff all the time they're used to it see and they it's just like 1q deuteronomy a they're they're used to that kind of stuff 
and they read the shorthand and they just roll with the flow. Well, anyway, those are a couple of good examples of it. All right, let me get down to the end of this. We're almost to the end of the transmission thing. All right. This is where we need to go. So, in the late medieval years, like we're, we're talking about the 1400s, like when the printing press was just being introduced and most people still had manuscript books. Uh, this was also the time of the Reformation movement. It was the time when learning was just exploding all over everywhere and people were questioning things they'd been taught. And the reason for this was the Crusades. The Crusades began in the latter part of the 11th century and into the 12th, the 13th century, where the, it was the battle to take the Holy Land back from the Muslims and uh, recapture Jerusalem. And uh, these cr Crusades, you know, would get these uneducated um, ruffians, these knights from European countries like Germany and Spain and France and Great Britain, and they would take them to the east, and uh, they would tell them that if they went back east and went to the Holy Land and fought against the Saracens, that they would have their sins forgiven, and uh, if they died in combat, they'd go right to heaven, and they wouldn't have anything to worry about. So the, the, uh, the purpose of these was to reclaim and protect the city of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. And uh, so there's a, there's a great movie that I enjoyed. It's called The Kingdom of Heaven with Orlando Bloom. It's a really good movie about the Crusades and the battle for Jerusalem. But uh, what happened was this, these things happened over and over again for a series of, of uh, two or three centuries. And every time they went to the east, they brought back stuff that ended up bringing more knowledge and more learning into the West. Everything from astronomy to ancient Greek literature to philosophy to manuscripts of the Bible, etc. And what happened was, in Europe, the result of this was the rise of the universities. Now, a university in the beginning was nothing but a group of people that had been exposed to some kind of this knowledge from the Crusades, and they would get together and they would talk about it and discuss it and read it and say, well, what do you think about this based on what we know? And so the latest thing that would come back from the East would be discussed in these gatherings, and these gatherings of people that were discussing all this new learning were called universities. And at first it was a little bit informal, and as time went by it became more formal uh, so that uh, people uh, were formalizing the study more of these different things. Uh, some of them specialized in Greek studies, some of them in astronomy, some of them in medicine, some of them in mathematics, Arabic mathematics. Uh, these other kinds of things. And um, the Greek and Arabic world were miles ahead, educationally, of the Western European world coming out of the Dark Ages. So it was during these times that people began questioning everything that they had been assuming during the Dark Ages, from the whether the Earth was uh, flat or round to whether whether um, the, the, uh, all the planets uh, revolved around the earth or the sun, uh, to uh, medical things, whether blood was the source of life or the source of death, and you know, on and on we could go. But um, it was in this milieu that 
people like Leonardo da Vinci and other people were studying everything from art to medicine to anatomy to uh, everything else. And people were talking about stuff and, and uh, education was growing. Well, uh, among the things that they were talking about were the Bible and the, the text of the church fathers and the, uh, the, the study of the Greek text as opposed to just the Latin text. We already talked about the Gutenberg brothers in the latter part of this time inventing the printing press, which even helped more learning be disseminated in the form of uh, printed books that people could share and read and talk about. And this is the time period in which Erasmus started working on the Greek text instead of the Latin text. And uh, it was also during this time that the Reformation occurred, which produced a lot of the uh, religious developments that went from Catholicism to Protestantism and all that kind of good stuff. Um, notice, I thought this is a really cool picture here. This is Erasmus's Greek text with the Latin text next to it. But see the, the, the triangular part at the top that's kind of the title stuff? Uh, if you look at the part that's in the brighter, that's not shadowed, it says faithful recognition uh, of, and then the one, two, three, fourth line from the bottom, Erasmus of Rotterdam, and then it says Sacre Theologiae Professorum, Professor of Sacred Theology. See? And he's, he's the one that's produced this text that's now printed in this. You see what I'm talking about up there? Yeah. Yes. And that was at Cambridge, right? Yes. Here you've got his uh, Greek and Latin in the in the Greek side. In RK ein hologos. In the beginning was the word. In um, the Latin side, in principio erat verbum. And the Spanish picked up this word verbum, word. Uh, instead of using the Spanish word palabra, which means word, the Spanish Bible uses the word. Verbal, which, like our word verb, that's the word that they use to translate word. Here's what I was looking for a little bit ago. I don't know how I found it, accidentally. Um, in the first edition in 1516 of Erasmus's printed Greek New Testament, this is the way he wrote 1 John 5, 7. And if you start at the top there, hote, because trace, there are three hoi marturuntis that bear witness, second line, second word, tonuma, the spirit, kai tohudor, and the water, kai tohima, and the blood. And these three agree in one. See, that is the way it is in the critical Greek text. Without the addition. See, he doesn't write in this one, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three agree in one, and there are three that bear witness in earth. He doesn't do that. He just puts the short version like we have in the critical Greek text. But several years later, in his third edition, after they cooked up that fake manuscript for him, here's what he writes. There are three that bear witness inside the box, in heaven. See the word heaven there on the first, the second line inside the box? Urano. See it? Yes. yes. And then right after the word heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three agree in one. And then on the last of the third line there, 
there are three that mar to rune tests on the earth. There are three that bear witness on the earth. And then you have the spirit and the water and the blood. See how he changed it to add the stuff in the third edition? So I find this very cool, you know, all these guys that love Erasmus and the Texas Receptus, I says, say, but what about this right here? And what made him add it right here later on? So interesting, huh? I couldn't, I couldn't pass up making that slide. Okay, um, this is another example of uh, uh, the printing in Erasmus's Bible. Uh, it says here, they rejoice with great and exceeding joy. And entering into the house, uh, they saw the child and Mary, his mother, and falling down, they worshipped him and they opened their treasure chests and they gave to him gifts of gold and frankenship, frankincense and myrrh. That comes from Matthew, the second chapter. Right there. We already did that. We already did all that. Okay. So, let's, we're going to take you up almost to the end. This little dude here is Constantine von Tischendorf. And in the 1800s, he was, he was hot after manuscripts. He was all over the world trying to find Greek manuscripts of the Bible. He's, he's the one that found Sinaiticus in the monastery of St. Catherine on his various travels through Egypt and Palestine and all this stuff. And he developed a critical Greek text of the New Testament that was one of the earlier ones. And then we had, in the 1800s, we had Brookfoss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, the two great textual scholars that studied manuscript after manuscript after manuscript that Tischendorf and others put together. And they came up with the observed proclivities of scribes. You know, the, the different kinds of errors that scribes would make and explaining how they arose and all that stuff. And they wrote big volumes of stuff. And along with von Tischendorf and others, they were working at developing a critical Greek text that would be more accurate than what the Textus Receptus was based on the earlier manuscripts that were being found. So it was during this time in the late 1800s that people began to talk about the need for some new English translations that were based on the better Greek text and were in more modern English. In our day and time, the most prominent textual scholar has been Bruce Manning Metzger. <clears throat> there have been a lot of others, but he's been a prolific scholar that has been a wonderful help and, and wrote the text of the New Testament and the textual commentary and all this kind of stuff. He's also headquartered in England, has some great books that are worthy of, of our reading. Uh, but there have been others, as we said, that have screamed and yelled against all this critical text of, of the New Testament stuff. And they insist that we go back to the uh, Texas Receptus, like David Otis Fuller. Um, early in our history, in our Church of Christ history in this um, uh, country, Brother Foy E. Wallace Jr. was a huge proponent of uh, the T King James Version only, and that you're liberal if you don't stick with King James Version and all this kind of stuff. And he had such a profound effect on a lot of people that he just, a lot of people came to believe in the Church of Christ that if you didn't stick with the King James tradition, 
you were somehow liberal and were leaving the Word of God and were suspected of uh, being unfaithful to the text. And that tradition continues today in some circles, but it's a it's a a much less respected position in the scholarly world. Okay, let's see. We've already been over all that. We've already been over all that. So, this is a lot of stuff I know, but what what really blesses me as as a person that studies the New Testament all the time is when I can you know, open my Greek New Testament and study it day after day after day, and then I can look at some of these old, old manuscripts and they say exactly what my Greek New Testament says. And that just really solidifies in my soul that we really can trust the text of the New Testament. Short answer, why? How can we trust it? Because of the just huge, massive amount of actual physical evidence we have for the text of the New Testament. Almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, dating all the way from the end of the first century up to the 16th century. Okay, we already did that. So, when I'm talking to people on a much smaller level than what I've been talking to you, I say our Bible is based on these ancient scrolls of the Old Testament. You know, it's based on these things that are the Dead Sea Scrolls and things that are held in libraries all over the world. It's based on these ancient papyrus Documents like P66 and P75 and P46, you know. It's based on all these versions like Coptic and Ethiopic. Uh, all of these translations over the ages, you know. And we have those ancient manuscripts translated in our translations today. So I end up telling them that as long as they've got one of any number of translations that's actually a translation, they don't have to worry about whether it really is the original. What they need to do is just do what it says. And, and uh, I try to affirm to them that we really can have a great deal of confidence in the transmission of the text of the Bible. So... We've talked about the biblical claims for the inspiration of the Bible. We've talked about the evidence that supports the canonicity of the various books of the Bible. And now we've talked in some detail about the copying and recopying and the transmission of the text of the Bible. Each of those is a very important area. And the last section of our class, which we're going to be talking about after we have the test over transmission, is the history of the English Bible, which is very interesting in and of itself. Okay, so let me see how much time we've got. We've got two minutes for a review before we have our... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so what we'll do, Lord willing, is we'll have a review over transmission on Thursday. We'll have a good long review. And then we will begin into the section on the English Bible. Great. Go from there. All right. Oh, by the way, I always like to end this section with this because God really has kept his promise. He said, all flesh is grass and the glory thereof is a flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Isn't it amazing how God has preserved the text of his word over all these years?
the more you understand about it, the more you realize how incredible that really is. All right, guys and girls, we'll see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I got you. Oh, sorry. I meant to tell you earlier. Um, I'm going to go in the morning. Okay. Drop it off. So I'll probably...